Hello, beloved. Welcome back here to our study of the book of First Timothy. So I just want to thank you all for joining us to our small Bible class. And so grab your Bibles and let's get started to see what Paul has to say in his letter to Timothy. We're going to start our reading King James and then the NIV. First Timothy chapter 5. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to require their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusted in God, and continued in supplication and prayers, day and night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge, that they may be blameless. But if any provide not his own, not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she had brought up her children, if she had lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widow refused, for when they began to wax wanton against Christ, they were merry, have a damnation, because they have cast off their first faith, and with all they learned to be idle wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I would therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give non occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. If a man or woman that believe have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture said, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Amen. Wow, that was a lot, huh? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's see if I can read this quickly. NIV, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. Verse 5. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Wow. Verse 7. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith. And it's worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless... She is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Verse 11. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their essential desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Verse 16. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. Verse 17, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water, and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent Ill illnesses. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious. And even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Mm. <clears throat> wow. That was a lot. Yeah. So here I was thinking where it says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. I was thinking, I think the last lesson, somewhere I was reading it said, Do not rebuke an elder openly. 20. What does verse 20 King James say? Them that sin rebuke, rebuke before all that others also may fear. Over here it says, but those elders who are sinning. 
you ought to reprove before everyone. So, but the King James doesn't say that. So, what do you think? It says in one one other passage, it says don't rebuke them publicly. So, I think mm -hmm. I'm gonna go with the King James. Yeah, King what that one twenty? Yeah, then twenty twenty doesn't say elder; it just says person. Who do you think it's referring to? Well, nineteen he said against an elder. We still talking about elder to me. Uh, it's against an elder receiving our accusation, but between two or three witnesses. Them, since we was just talking about elder, I believe he's still talking about elders. Okay. Just but why would he say? Witnesses. But why would he say don't do it? Oh, you're oh okay. I see what you're you're saying. If there's three, two or three witnesses, yeah. okay, that I makes it a two or three. Witnesses. That makes a difference. Okay, I mm. see what you're saying. Okay, that makes a lot of difference. Okay, because the King James verse one says what? Yeah, rebuke not an elder, but and treat him as a father. Yeah. See. Mm -hmm. And then what about like the rest of that passage where it says treat younger men as brothers. Verse 2, older women as mothers. And younger as sisters. Women as purity. sisters with absolute purity. Is this why we refer to each other in this church as brother and sister? That's right. What mm -hmm. the King James say, verse 2? The younger as sisters. The other women as mothers. The younger as sisters with all purity. There should be some respect toward them. And I think it's mostly referring to the men in mm -hmm. the church. Yeah. You know, to not have this playboy type attitude when you come into the church yeah, building, yeah. you are to respect these women. I think mm -hmm. that's that's the theme or what it's trying to say. That's right. That's right. And so, but I notice here, verse two, it says older women as mothers. But I know some churches they do refer to some of the leaders in the, the women leaders in the church as mothers, and don't they usually wear white? Oh yeah, and, sometimes uh, some other organizations. Yeah, they do some denominations. Yeah, other organizations. I just wondering. I know we don't do that in the Lord's Church, but I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. But it says here, if you're going to call them brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with that. I won't say it's a sin. I don't know if I would encourage it, but I don't see it as a. I don't see it as a sin because we're doing the same thing with the uh, brothers and sisters. But okay, that's uh huh. Wait, wait. Okay, we better go on. I think that was enough. Uh, okay, what about verse 3? Honor widows that are widows indeed. And then it gives us the qualifications of a widow indeed. And verse 5 gives the qualifications. But verse 4 does too. It says if she has children or grandchildren. So if she, if she it says, verse 4 says, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first to put their religion to practice and care for their own family so she can't have family that's taking care of her yeah. before you get to the other part mm -hmm. she ha if she she has to be by herself that's right alone that's right. and no one there to care for her mm -hmm. because verse 5 says the widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help that's what the uh NIV says, yeah, and that makes sense. She's yeah, by herself. That's right. And she needs someone to take care of her, the church. Yep. And then verse 6 says, what King James says. Verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Why is that, though? Why do you think that is? But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Because she's not living for the Lord. Mm -hmm. not, God is not a priority. When we live for pleasure, it could be, it also could be uh, construed as living for yourself. Yeah, and then there's a. So he's saying she's dead. She's spiritually, spiritually dead. dead. That's what you're going yeah, yeah, because she's living dead. for herself. Mm -hmm. And of course, you don't have to be a widow to be living, you know, doing yeah. this. But this is what this subject is talking about. Yeah, it's that's talking about. Dead. Yeah, this is talking about uh, uh, being a child of God. And then verse 7, King James says what? And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. I like the NIV says, give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Mm -hmm. And so once again, the theme is with the with the rest of this book 
is to make sure the church knows about this. Yeah. yeah. So every church needs to read First Timothy in Bible class or worships and or worship service and at home and know. Yep. You know uh, about this and make sure that we're living it and applying it mm-hmm. to our mm-hmm. you know our congregations. And then verse eight: Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so he's just letting people know, you know, I guess mainly the males, if you don't provide for your own home. But he's talking about the family too, right? Yeah. It says anyone does not provide for their relatives. Yeah. And so I just want to interject too right here. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives. I don't see this as only having to do with material things. It could also include, because the Bible is not only a book of commands, it's a book of principles. Yeah, this right. could also include just visiting your family that's in need. Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of church people are guilty of this, but we still have to put it out there. We need to visit our relatives, yep, yep. especially when they get older, even if it's aunts and uncles. And even if they're not church members, because this is how you win people to Christ. That's right. That's when right. people see the love of Christ in us, mm-hmm. and that helps convert people to Christianity. Yeah. You know, I think there's a scripture in the Bible says the love of God leads people to repentance. That's right. And so it's not just talking about money. You know, you just go check on someone. That's right. And here in the United States of America, you know, we have a welfare system. Praise the Lord. We Mm -hmm. have Social Security. Praise the Lord. A lot of people have retirement plans or some type of money coming in when they get older. And so this widow indeed you know, and, and putting them on the list and all of this, it uh, it ain't it's not really needed here in the United States. Yeah, not, it's not. probably a little needed a little bit more now since the pandemic, because there are a lot of people that's on Social Security that's homeless mm-hmm. now because their Social Security benefits can't even pay rent. Yep, yep, yep. You know, let alone food and medicine, That's it right. can't even pay people's rent these days. That's right. And so, does okay. So, does this mean verse nine on? I don't necessarily want to read this again, but verse nine on, where it's talking about the widow indeed. Does this mean the church don't supposed to take care of nobody else, only widows? Does 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 that mean we can wash our hands of helping anybody else in the church? No, no, because scripture. Scripture go against that, just leaving everybody else out except the widow indeed. Right now, we just um, pretty much talking about the widow indeed right now. But it don't exclude taking helping care of other church members. members. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a thing. I think that's in the Lord's church today, I'm speaking in general, that I don't think this is an overall problem, but I see it as a shortcoming. Just this, just me, mm. because you know we all read the same Bible, but it just seems like there's a teaching or there's a doctrine in the Lord's church. You called it. What'd you say? Saints only. Yeah, saints only. Well, we're only supposed to help the church and not the outside world. But at the same time, I don't see us helping the church enough, especially since the pandemic. Mm. You have a lot of church members, they won't even go to the leadership and ask for help because they don't believe they're going to get the aid. Mm-hmm. They're embarrassed. You know, we should, see, we should see the church as our family because we're supposed to be family. That's right. Who would have a problem going to their family and asking for help? Yeah. Whether it's financial or you need some food or a place to stay or lay your head. I believe we should be able to approach the church with the same thing. That's right. That's right. And if we can't, we need to ask ourselves why. Mm-hmm. And that's what we need to think about in our congregations. What? How is this? How is this perceived at our congregation? Yeah. yeah. Some churches teach leaders, oh, the church ain't a bank. Didn't nobody say you was a bank. You have a saying on that. What'd you oh, say? Yeah. yeah, bank, you got to pay the money back. Church, you don't. You, know, you get money right. from the church, you don't have to pay that back. A bank work like a loan. A loan? Yeah, yeah well, right, right, right. right. We know that's what, that ain't what the yeah, church on that, we, so it shouldn't be like a loan. And we see in Acts chapter 2, they sold all they had. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean we have to sell everything today. It's the attitude yeah, yeah. of how we reach out and help one another. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And we should ask ourselves, does our church have a pantry? And if it does, and if it does have a pantry, just having a pantry ain't good enough. Does your members know about it? Do no. and do they have access to it? Mm -hmm. They should be able to just go in there. I'm speaking in general, just go in there and get stuff. Yeah. Some people are afraid, and the leadership is going to turn them down. We should not have fear. That's this right. is our family. That's right. That's right. And so, but in the United States, no, we don't really have no widows and deeds here. We could. I'm not saying we don't. I'm sure there's some somewhere. Yeah. But overall, we don't have no widow in need. Now, we have some that qualify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure some preacher's wives or elder's wives, deacon's wives or Bible class teachers. Or you yeah. just have a woman being faithful. She's been faithful at that congregation and she's done these things. She's known for good deeds. Like in verse 11, you know, you ha we have some people like that. But a lot of them don't need financial help mm -hmm. in America, which is good. But with this new administration that's trying to get in office, they've been trying to get rid of Social Security and welfare. And that's not really fair, especially how this country is uh, constantly up and down with yeah, the economy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it'll be up, you know, like in 2008, the housing crisis. Millions of people lost their homes. Then it got better. Then it got worse after the pandemic. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so to just turn your back on your own citizens is not good. But anyway, this is about the church. And so church people should not fear hard times because yeah. we should know that the, our congregation is going to be there for us. Yeah. Okay, so let's go verse 11. We can read verse 11. But the younger widow refused. For when they had begun to wax wanton against Christ, they were married. Mm -hmm. Verse 12 says, Have a damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And so this is like really telling us how serious God is about our, our priority, making him number one. Mm -hmm. Like Matthew 6 uh, 33 says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness right. and all these things will be added to you what what all things everything you need that's kind of what he's saying right here mm -hmm. and he's saying and it, this says younger widows but it really just means younger people yeah yeah because like it says younger widows maybe back then they had younger widows but like how do we apply this to our lives today especially here in the United States because other countries still have this problem, like India yeah. and Africa. They have a lot of young widows. Yeah. So this definitely applies to them. But in the United States, we don't have a lot of younger widows. No. Most people in the United States aren't widows until they're at least uh, 50, 60, or 70 years old. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But like I was saying earlier, the Bible is also a book of principles. And so this, this also pertains to younger people. Mm -hmm. Younger women, we don't want to be known as, like he's saying right here in verse eleven, where we giving over to our sexual, over our, over to our sensual desires. Mm -hmm. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, we don't want that no, to happen. No. He says they want to marry. Yeah. So a lot of widows, I think it's an honor. For a lot of widows to say, you know what, I'm not going to try to get married again. Mm -hmm. Even if you're 50, I'm not saying they should be condemned. But sound like here, he ain't putting them on a the pedestal. Yeah, yeah. He's not He's not congratulating them on wanting to be married. Right? Isn't that what yeah. it sounds like? Because right. verse 12, he says, bring judgment on themselves. Yeah. Because why? They have broken their first pledge. And then he's saying they're going from house to house. Being a busybody, gossiping, talking nonsense. Yeah, yeah. So verse 14, he says, over here says, I counsel younger widows to marry. And over there it says, what, verse 14? I would therefore that the younger w women marry. He don't say widow. Yeah, yeah. So that's like what I'm saying. It's a principle for young people mm -hmm. to just because you're young, just like what Paul told Timothy, just because you're young. I mean, he told him in the in other uh, chapter. That no one look down on you just because you're young. Yeah, that's He's right. saying the same thing right here to the younger women. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, I was guilty of this when I was young, when you and I got married. I wasn't running around gossiping and stuff, but I had this party spirit. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a household where there was just people partying all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought that's what I thought everybody partied 24 <laughs> 
<laughs> That's what I did, and it's not good, but it took me a long time. It took God about 15, 20 years to get that party spirit out of me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I think... Uh, yeah, you know, that party spirit a mm-hmm. lot of young people have. I think that's why the book of Titus chapter 2 says train up the, the older women how to train up the younger women that's on right. how to be a homemaker and love their husbands and all this. Right. I didn't really have that training. I don't see a lot of that talk training mm-hmm. in the church. Yeah, But I do see a lot of criticizing the younger women or look how she dressing or, you know what I'm saying? As, you know, she having all these babies. But is anyone really sitting these girls down or try to reach them? And I know they hard to reach. That's yeah. a whole nother topic right there, how to reach the young people. But in general, I think the problem is the reason we're not able to reach younger people. Mm. We take too long before we try to reach them. Yeah, yeah. When Titus says to train up the younger women, or even right here what he's talking about, we have to teach people this. I think we need to start this when they're like three or four or five years yeah. old. We wait till yeah. they're like yeah. 12 or 13. They, they stubborn in. Yeah. I think we take too long. And we need to start preparing our youngsters, men and male and female, for marriage. Letting them know what it's about. Yeah. Whether they want to get married or not. Not encouraging them to get married. But at least open their eyes to know what That's it's right. about. Because right. the world ain't going to do it. Mm-mm. The world's not going to do it. And so, so, anyway, he's so he's telling them to get married right here. Mm-hmm. At the top, it's like verse 11. He criticized them for wanting to get married. But then in 14, he says, I tell them to get married. That's right. That's right. Because marriage is 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 uh, it helps you settle down. Like I was telling you the other day, some people say, "Oh, she she only staying home now because she got a babysit because she had a baby. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, she'd be out there running around." Like that's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Sure Children should slow you down. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Okay, so so he said they should marry. And I definitely agree because he says, I counsel the younger widows or younger women to marry, have children, manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Yep. And then, unfortunately, in verse 15, he says, some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. So this stuff is already happening. Everything Paul wrote about in all these letters mm-hmm. in the New Testament, the reason he's talking about this because this stuff has already happened yep. in the early church. And then verse 16. So I just want to say if anyone's young or you have young uh, grandchildren or young daughters, encourage them to marry. That's what he's saying. Because otherwise, what are you telling them? This is deep what I'm going to say. And so I hope people take this with a grain of salt with some good discernment. If you, a lot of times we tell our young people don't get married, mm-hmm. but are you telling them not to have sex, or are true. you giving them birth control true, true. and prophylactics? Yeah, yeah. Because that's what the world does. The world tell you don't get married, but then they hand you condoms. Yeah, yeah. You're still messing their life up. Yeah, yeah. And what's the chances of them using the condoms all the time? That's right. Huh? That's right. And then they wind up having kids out of wedlock. Just tell them don't have sex. Yep, yep. They can wait. It ain't the end of the world. And it is possible. There are people that <laughs> people think that no one get married a virgin anymore. Yes, they do. Really you do. have people virgins that never been married. And they probably never will get married. And they 30, 40, 50 years old. Mm-hmm. So I think we just need to have faith in our young people. All young people ain't messed up. He reversed... Uh, 16... If any man or woman that believe it have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Yeah. So he's saying, let me see if the notes say anything. Apparently, some older widows have been put on the list of widows meaning that they had taken a vow committing themselves to work for the church in exchange for financial support. Paul lists a few qualifications for these church workers. These widows should be at least 60, should have been faithful to their husbands, and should be well known for their kind deeds. Younger widows should not be included in this group because they might desire to marry again and thus have to break their pledge. Three out of four wives today eventually are widowed. And many of the older women in our churches have lost their husbands. 
Does your church provide an avenue of service for these women? Could you help match their gifts and abilities with your church's needs? Often their maturity and wisdom can be of great service in the church. And so I think this too, Mm -hmm. like I was saying, you have some places like India and Africa, probably China too, places that have billions of citizens. They do have widows and widows in need. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, so they're saying is don't overload the congregation. You know, even if you can help on an individual basis, that's, I think that's what he's saying, no? Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. So he said, mm-hmm. if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them, see? Yeah, yeah. So I got over here in my notes, my personal notes. This is a Bible principle. We are to help all church members in need. Yet, especially widows and the fatherless. That's per James, what, 127. We say visit the widows and orphans right. in their distress. That 127, 126. It's one of my favorite passages. Then it's not just about, also this is a principle. It's not just about only helping the widows in need. It's even like widows that's like in nursing homes. True, true. A lot of people don't visit these people in nursing homes, even church members. I know. Because I visit them and I notice that they hardly get any visitors. Even if a congregation has four or five hundred people showing up every Sunday. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're neglecting these people. That's right. That's, God is not happy with that. And we need to put ourselves in their shoes. Because if we don't have a system, by the time we get old, it's going to happen to us. Yeah, that's right. Or you're going to be sitting in the nursing home. You've been in the church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Been a faithful member. You've in the nursing home. And no one's visiting no visit- you. Your own family ain't visiting you. At least the church to visit you, but they're not even visiting you. Mm-mm. I've seen this happen, and it's a travesty. It's not good. So we need to do well to make we do well to make sure we have programs. That's right. For this, and I'm talking to the ladies. That's who mostly follow my ministry, my women's ministry, which is what it's for. We need to put some type of programs in place, and I've done this uh, myself at congregations where I've worshipped at. We need to make sure that the elderly, not just the widows, but the widowers too, the men too, are are be, not being overlooked. That someone is visiting them and making sure they're okay, right. even if they show up every Sunday, go to their home. That's right. People get lonely. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, people get lonely during the week. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, they come to worship on Sunday in Bible class, but you can still get lonely. And that's where we Christians, we should show hospitality to one another and that's visit right. one another. Right. Okay, let's see. Let's go forward. Okay, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. What the scripture said. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, if you have a. Be counted worthy of double honor and a word. You know, church leaders, they should be appreciated. Supported and appreciated Mm -hmm. elders. Is this talking about money? Just paying them? No, not not, 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 not just paying them. Supported and appreciated. Appreciated, you know. Um, Just uh, showing respect, you know. And uh, the scripture that said that thou thou shalt not mother the ox that tread out the corn, then they should get some kind of faith. Yeah. yeah, compensation. Mm-hmm. It says, "Not be the worker deserves his rage, wages." Let me see. The note says, "Faithful church leaders should be supported and appreciated. Too often, they are targets for criticism because the congregation has unrealistic expectations. How do you treat your church leaders? Do you enjoy finding fault, or do you show your appreciation? Do they receive enough financial support to allow them to live without worry and to provide for the needs of their families?" Jesus and Paul emphasize the importance of supporting those who lead and teach us. Our ministers deserve to know that we are giving to them cheerfully, gratefully, and generously. So, yeah, I think it's both because I know some churches, they don't believe in paying their Mm. preachers or whatever. But 
Why not? That's what the Bible says. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I think the problem is people are thinking, oh, we don't want them to be out buying no jet plane or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's unrealistic. Is it not Cadillacs, more? Mercedes Benz. See people looking like that. Yeah. And they're going into the extreme with it. Yeah. And um, they don't say that. Mm-hmm. The scripture said, which you had just read, said what they need. Just what they need, not exactly that they the want. The notes, I read the notes. Yeah, you know, a Cadillac or something. They don't really need a Cadillac. Just take care of them. Yeah. But it yeah. says worker deserves his wages. So I think they should be paid some monies from the donations yeah, that's they given. Be paid now. Or definitely making sure they're taken care of. Mm-hmm. I think that's what he's saying overall. Mm-hmm. You know, people think preaching and teaching is easy. It's not. No, not. To understand a word of God accurately, you not only have to read it, you got to live it. Yeah. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit helps us understand the truth yeah. or right. the word of God. Right. I have a saying, disobedience destroys discretion. This is why we have so much false teaching in the world and in these churches. Mm-hmm. Because these people are not living right. Yeah. They're not living right. Not only was they not taught right, but even some that are taught right. And then they go start twisting the scriptures or omitting or adding to the word of God, Mm -hmm. you know, with this faith only or grace alone or once saved, always saved. They use them people not living right. They either just caring about money, want to get paid, don't want to be persecuted. I'm speaking in general. You, their heart ain't right or something. Only God really knows. That's right. But why you don't, why you not grasping the scriptures somewhere? Usually these people not living right. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to wrap this up. Let me see. And so we already read 20 where it's talk about uh, uh, to reprove the elders. You said before everyone. Mm-hmm. And then verse 21, what does 21 say? I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. Doing nothing by partiality. Mm-hmm. Oh, here say don't show favoritism. So don't just pick certain people you're going to help. Mm-hmm. Don't pick certain people mm-hmm. in the church you're going to rebuke. Yeah. Just treat everybody equal, the That's same, right. regardless right. of their skin color or how much money they make or how they look, you know, whether they yep. handsome yep. or not. Mm -hmm. Or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then verse 22 says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Yeah. So he was telling Timothy, laying on hands. Do we lay on hands today? Oh, no. this No, we don't today. The church doesn't do this. Why? The laying on hands was something that the apostles had. And they they can pass it on to, to someone. And to make them... Laying on hands and make them a leader or too quickly. That's what he's saying. Don't be quick yeah, to do it. Don't yeah. be quick to uh, to make someone. Don't be too quick to make someone an elder. And that's what yeah. we was discussing in chapter three. Yeah. yeah. How people are, are uh, appointing these people as elders. They don't even really know these people. And you're pe- picking people as elder for another yeah. congregation. Yeah. That's right. And then because they got some letter mm-hmm. from the church saying they're okay. We need to be really suspect of that. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what he's saying. He said, do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Mm -hmm. That, I think, a good example is some of these churches, for instance, the Catholic Church. Yeah. They say that it's, it's, the Catholic Church has been sued for millions of dollars. I've seen this on the news. We all have seen it over Mm -hmm. and over for decades. They know that these so-called priests are molesting children but then they just keep transfer, transferring them to different yeah, Catholic around. buildings. Yeah. They're sharing in their sins. Yep, yep. And some churches do, you know, even in the Lord's church. You know, you find out a preacher or someone's doing something. And then you come to church one day and he's gone. And we're like, what happened? No one knows. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know if that's right. Yeah. He says rebuke publicly, openly. That's you right. know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be transparent mm-hmm. as the church, and we're supposed to hold each other accountable. Yes. That's the difference between the Lord's church and denominations yeah. is we are to be transparent and hold each other accountable. Yep. Yep. And the people like denominations in general because they don't hold them accountable. They don't care when they show up, yep. when they don't show up, as long as they're getting their money. Okay, verse 23. Does verse 23 mean we can drink alcohol? I know, no, no. Verse 23, drink no longer water. We use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often 
infirmities. I think I heard someone say alcohol people used it as a medicinal. Mm -hmm. This was before alcohol was legalized in the United States. Yeah, yeah, that's what it. Or around the world. That's what he's saying, you know. For you see, he said for dying often. Yeah, but infirmity. some people use this to say they could drink. That's all I'm saying. Okay, twenty four. We gotta wrap this up. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Amen. That's kind of what Jesus said mm -hmm. was done in the dark. will be bought to light. That scripture right. isn't in my, I ain't making that up, am I? That's Let me right. read That's the notes good. down here. It says, Paul says that a church should never be in a hurry about choosing its leaders, especially the pastor, because major problems or sins might be overlooked. It is a serious responsibility to choose church leaders. They must have strong faith and be morally upright, having the qualities described in 3, 1 through 13 and Titus 1, 5 through 9. Not everyone who wants to be a church leader is eligible. Be certain of an applicant's qualifications before asking him or her to take a leadership position. And uh, 23, 523. Yeah. It is unclear why Paul gave this advice to Timothy. Perhaps contaminated water had led to Timothy's indigestion, and so he should stop drinking only water. Whatever the reasons, this statement is not an invitation to overindulgence or alcoholism. And I got or drinking. Okay, so I don't know why they put uh, 22, 24, 25 over 23, but yeah. it didn't say nothing really about 24, but I guess... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess he's just warning him here in 24. Read 24 right fast in 25. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment. And some men, they follow after. Likewise also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Yeah, so he's just saying eventually. He's saying don't rush because some people you don't know. Yeah, you won't find out the later. Yeah, you won't find on. out later what they're doing. But he said that's why he's saying don't rush into making someone an elder. Mm -hmm. And then he said some of them God already knows. Yep. Where he says right here, the sins of others trail behind them. Yep. Oh no, not that one. Where the sins of some are always where he says reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. Some people just walk in their sin. That's all they do. Yeah. And it's yeah. like God already knows, but it's just waiting for judgment day for them. Yeah, you know because uh, yeah, because there's no Sodom and Gomorrah today. Mm -hmm. God is not going to. What I mean is, God is not going to strike down a nation like He did back then, contrary to popular yeah. belief, where some people are trying to cause fear to get people to vote one way or another. No, that's not the way God works today. If that was the case, the whole world would be destroyed, and, and the United States of America would that's have got right. destroyed about four, five hundred years ago that's or right. longer. With the evil that they permeated on the Native Americans and other people in this nation yeah, yeah. that was either here before, during, or after them. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. we don't live under that law today. No, no. That's not the law today. The Bible says each man is appointed unto man. Once a day. And after that, the judgment. That's on an individual basis. No one is going to be judged. I'm not going to be judged by what a president does or That's governors, right. all right. that stuff. None of us are. Nope. We're going to be held accountable for our own. That's right. For what we do. So I really liked it, that chapter. That said a lot. Mm. But I just think the most important part, of course, all of it is important. But for me, I think the best thing out of this is to care for each other. That's right. Jesus said you should know them. They shall know you by your love for one another. Mm -hmm. And I just think we just really need to do that in the church. And even just hearing it, because a lot of times we don't hear it. Yeah. But I think we need, it needs to be active, not just we love and shake each other's hand, greet mm -hmm. each other with the holy mm -hmm. kiss. We need to actually be there for one another and stop being afraid. That's right. That's like, what are we afraid of? I remember I closed out on this. I remember visiting this congregation in uh, Washington. I think it's, uh, what is it, Tahoma? Tacoma, Tacoma, Washington, I visited this congregation, mm -hmm. and I'm a woman of color, and most of the people there were Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Those people, when I visited there, they were so kind to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were offering me food, trying to take, they had just met me, trying to take me out, mm -hmm. you know, to dinner or go places with. They were very, very hospitable. Mm -hmm. This is the way we should be. That's right. 
That's right. You know what I'm saying? They was not afraid. It's like sometimes, you know, people, we're afraid to reach out to the visitors. Or mm-hmm. this is your brother and sister in Christ. And if they not your brother and sister in Christ, if they are a visitor, that's an opportunity to soul win. That's right. That's right. We should never look at a person and only see their skin color. That's right. That's right. But the kindness, the way they were so kind to me. And I mean, they just, I, I was like, man, if I ever leave this town, that's where I'm living. Yeah. I want to go live right up there by those people. Mm-hmm. Because that that was a beautiful church. The way that they loved one another. Mm-hmm. Of course, I only visited twice. So I don't know everything was going on there. But I'm just saying their hospitality. Yeah. And love and concern and, and, you know, the way they reached out to me. I just felt like I was at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when someone visits our congregation, that's the way they should feel, like they're at home. That's right. So that's why I want to close out on, ladies. Thank you for listening, everyone who's listening. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know. And if you need prayers or anything, please let us know. I know this lesson was kind of long. It was kind of hard to make it short. There was a lot to read there. And so uh, just split this lesson in two. Listen to part now and the other part later. Do that with all the lessons. There's so much in these and what me and my husband is covering, giving uh, great insight, new insights to things you probably never heard before, but which are true and need to be heard in the kingdom. So thank you all for listening. May God, our Holy Father in heaven, continue to bless you so that you may always be a blessing wherever you go. Chat with you later. Bye-bye.